Welcome to Google Tech Talks. My name is Donald Tengwe, and uh, today we, we have a special guest talking to us. His name is uh, Tom Malsbender. He's from Hewlett Packard Laboratories just down the street in Palo Alto. And Tom is a senior researcher from uh, HP Labs. He has uh, worked in many things at, at, while at HP Labs, including one of the earliest tablet uh, devices and some brain cognitive uh, kinds of things before moving into computer graphics, I guess about 23 years ago. And uh, he's done things like volumetric rendering and um, poly polynomial texture maps, uh, things like that. And today he's going to talk about uh, one of his really exciting applications of his techniques um, about the Antikythera mechanism. And so this is an intersection of computer vision, computer graphics, and archaeology. And take it away, Tom. Great, thanks, Donald. Um, so I guess I want to start off and say that uh, if you have questions uh, during the talk, feel free to ask them. Um, the best thing would be to go up to the microphone to ask the question, so uh, I don't have to repeat all the questions, but uh, that would be ideal. Um, so basically, in 2001, um, a fellow HP Labs researcher and I developed um, a method called polynomial, polynomial texture mapping. And uh, it's a, an interesting technique in that it actually allows you to see more detail on the surface of objects than you can typically see, even holding them in your hand. And in 2005, we got sent to Greece to apply the technique to a mechanism called the Antikythera mechanism. Um, and this talk will cover both the, the imaging method itself and the, the Antikythera mechanism. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, uh, if there's time left, I'll go through just some more recent developments that we have on the, the imaging method uh, over the last 10 years or so. So it's, it's well known that um, as you change lighting direction, you can see more or less detail on the surface of an object. This is something that we use all the time when we hold objects relative to a light source and move them around. But what's not so well understood is that if you actually change the material properties of the object itself, you can often see more detail than, uh, than, is, than is possible with the quote, original material properties of the object. So the technique got developed in 2001. At the time, there were two main um, ways of applying textures to the surface of objects for computer graphics. And we did develop this as a, a method for computer graphics, although nowadays it gets used more in, in fields like archaeology and forensics uh, than, than 3D graphics. Um, but, it, but you know, one of those techniques is texture mapping that got developed in, in the mid-70s. And texture mapping you've all seen. Um, when you play a video game, the characters on, the, on it are all texture mapped, meaning that an image has been applied to the surface of them to give you a, a feel that, that there's more complexity there than, than you've geometrically modeled. Um, great technique. The problem with it is, is you change lighting um, interactively in, on texture maps. The lighting doesn't do the right thing to represent the underlying geometry. So Jim Blinn addressed that problem in the late 70s uh, by a technique called bump mapping. And what you do with that is you keep around surface normals for every pixel that you have in the texture map. And then you can use relighting techniques to, to use that normal to produce an image of what the surface would look like under, the, under new light source directions. That also works very well. The problem with it, though, is that it's not image based. Um, typically, you have artists draw these, these bump maps uh, and then uh, you know, they're, they're applied onto, onto the surface of objects. So it's not a photographic technique. The, the results are typically not photorealistic. So we developed polynomial texture maps, which are, um, well, I'll just, I'll just show you one. Let's just jump right into it. This is a PTM, or polynomial texture map, here. And uh, what we do, what we have is, is control, interactive control of lighting here. And the way we do this is uh, for every pixel, we keep around a reflectance function. So that's what's shown in, on the right here. And so every pixel you know, has this simple two-dimensional function uh, associated with it. And you can change lighting direction by probing in the circular area on the right. And you can look at the, what the reflectance functions are that we're modeling on the, uh, by probing the image itself for every pixel. So this is done independently for every pixel. So that's a PTM. How do you, how do you collect these things? Well. Um, here are two objects that we've used. Uh, the first one was the first thing I built, uh, basically in my garage uh, at home. It's just a, a dowel, wooden dowel assembly with hot melt glue. And you simply put a digital camera on a tripod on the top of it, looking down on the floor of this thing, and put an object in the, on the floor and move a table lamp to each face of this icosahedron and take 
in that case, 40 pictures of the same thing under different lighting directions. Pretty simple, simple technique. And on the right here is just a more elaborate version that we built a year or two later that has computer control, light sources. This all plugs into a laptop and, um, you know, with one, one stroke of a key, you can collect all, in this case, 50 images of the same thing under a different lighting direction. So no matter what kind of hardware you use to collect it, what you have is a stack of images where you've got a measurement of, for each pixel, you have a measurement of the color as a function of lighting direction. And then we just fit a, a biquadratic polynomial to that description of, of values. So specifically what we do is we, we fit a, a, a biquadratic polynomial to the luminance, to the you know, brightness basically of that pixel. And you'll see that these, uh, these LUs and LVs, those are just points in that circular space I was moving around before. They're just projections of the lighting vector onto the, the plane of the texture map. Um, so it's just the two-dimensional parameterization of the light source direction. And these A0 through A5s are what we keep around in the texture map. Um, that coefficients in addition to the, the, the unscaled color values. So the polynomial is used to compute the luminance that gets plugged into this set of equations here where we take our, our unscaled RGB values and just multiply them by those luminance values that we computed to recover what the, what the real RGB values are. And that's, that's how we do the renderings. That, those are the RGB values that, that are drawn. Now, um, one thing to point out about this equation is that it's really simple. Um, you know, it consists only of multiplies and adds, and therefore you can use parallel subword instructions in the CPU to evaluate this very quickly. So the PTMs that I'll be showing here don't use any graphics hardware support. They just run on the, the CPU directly and, you know, usually uh, give you real-time performance out. So I should backpedal a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So you use quadratic uh, polynomials here, but uh, when you have uh, shadows, these are step functions as a uh, uh, function of light. If somebody you know, suddenly falls into the shadow of some other part of your scene, you know, how does the quadratic deal with that? Yeah, um, so that's right. So uh, you know, for representing sharp details in lighting space, um, uh, you know, it's not an adequately high degree enough polynomial to represent very sharp edges. So what winds up happening is when we do apply these fitting functions is that we have smoothing in lighting space, not in image space, because this is done per pixel independently. But it's really equivalent to having lit the object with fairly large area light sources instead of point lights. Um, so that's, uh, that's right. So you have this, this low passing operation because you're, you're taking 50 data points and you're reducing it to, to, to five coefficients. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the format that I described for, before is just one of the formats that we have, and that is a polynomial description of the luminance and then fixed RGB values. We have, we've also done this with um, polynomials for each of the RGB components separately and encoded representations where we apply compression techniques, uh, lookup tables or uh, JPEG LS uh, to these representations, and they can get quite compact. Okay, so that's a, that's a PTM. Well, it turns out what the interesting part of this really is, though, is that you can extract all this information from PTMs that's interesting. So if you have a surface at some orientation, if you have a digital camera that's looking down at that surface, and you ask the question, where does the light source uh, need to go to maximize the brightness of that pixel? The answer is, for a diffuse object, perpendicular to the surface orientation. So if you find out, if you find the maximum of the surface orientation, which you can solve for analytically, you can um, come up with an estimate, pretty good estimate for the surface normal in this case. And again, you can, you can drive that analytically from the, uh, the function itself, so it's very quickly. So in the course of a half a second, we can compute all the surface normals for a, for a PTM. Now, let me show you how we use that. Um, we basically have two enhancement methods, both of which use that surface normal. And this is, this is showing one of them. So let me show it off on this 4,000-year-old uh, uh, cuneiform tablet. And it certainly helps to, to be able to vary your lighting to be able to see what's on the surface of that. Um, but uh, it's even more helpful to use those surface normals uh, for display. So if I turn this on, you can now see this red cross here, here, cross here, here that just corresponds to the maximum of the PTM for any, for any pixel. Well, if you use that to now synthesize synthetic specular highlights, 
you've now changed the material properties of the object. So we've got a slider here that um, controls the amount of diffuse, the, spec the diffuse coefficient of the, of the object. So I've just turned that all the way down. This slider here controls the degree of specular uh, reflections off the surface. I'll leave that up high. And then this slider just controls the, the specular exponent. So in other words, how, how wide or how narrow the specular highlights are off this object. And so when you do this, it turns out you can, you can now see a whole bunch of detail that, that was difficult to see before. So specifically, look at the two columns of, of text in the middle here. If I go back to the, uh, the original rendering, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to perceive those. Um, and while I have this up, if you would take a look at some of the, the grooves that occur here uh, on the top here, those turn out to be the fingerprints of the scribe 4,000 years ago that was holding this, this tablet when the tablet was still wet. And uh, that, that, was not, uh, that was not known to be on the surface of this tablet at the time we photographed it. So that's specular enhancement. That's, that's probably our most powerful technique for bringing out more surface detail. Um, another one that's very useful is something we call diffuse gain. And in this case, there's less of a, of a physical analog to what this is doing. There's really no, uh, there's really no physics in real material objects that, that does this sort of thing. But if you look at, if you probe the reflectance functions of any object that's diffuse, they're very slowly varying. You know, the, the brightness of an object doesn't change much as a function of lighting direction. Um, well, uh, it turns out we can, we can leave the, the estimate of the surface normal the same, but increase the curvature, the second derivative of the reflectance function. And when you do that, you can basically increase uh, contrast quite a bit in a geometric sort of way. So uh, we have a slider here that is tied to this, uh, the amount of gain that we have on the curvature on, this, on the second derivative here. And we can, uh, you know, we can see more or less detail on the surface of, these, uh, of this object, these inscriptions here, uh, than you can, you can typically see. So this, is, uh, this object is a 3,000-year-old uh, object, Egyptian art artifact called a Nushabti. Um, and it was typically wrapped up with mummies to help them in the afterlife. Yeah, thanks, Donald. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the imaging technique at this point. Um, so I am a member of HP Labs. I'm also a member of uh, what's known as the Antikythera Mechanism Research Project. And that consists of basically four groups of people. Um, first, you've got largely British astronomers. Um, You've got Greek epigraphers, people that study ancient writing. And then you've got a team of uh, people from a company called Xtech, which is a microfocus CT imaging company in the UK. And then you have a couple of us from HP Labs uh, that have done our surface imaging work. And I should say right off the bat, um, this group was pulled together by these two gentlemen, Tony Freeth and Mike Edmonds here. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the breakthroughs that you're really going to hear about um, here were done by, by Tony Freeth, and he also published the, uh, or wrote the Scientific American article that appeared in December. If you want more information on this, uh, I'll refer you to that. So the story starts with a shipwreck that occurred off the island of Antikythera, which is right next to the island of Kythera. And it was a Roman boat that was carrying loot, pillage, from um, perhaps, um, the Corinth area, perhaps uh, the Rhodes area. It's really not uh, exactly known uh, where the Antikythera mechanism originated from. That's a, a matter of dispute. But in any case, the ship did get close to this island of Antikythera. Uh, it hit a storm and was sunk. And this happened in, in, in the first century BC. And uh, the boat was underwater for roughly 2,000 years. And in 1900, Another group of, uh, another boat appeared on the scene, a group of sponge divers who were also hiding out from a similar storm. And when they went, when they awoke the next morning and dove down to look for sponges in that area, uh, they found what they thought were limbs all over the surface of the, of the ocean floor. And what these were were uh, life size and larger than life size marble and bronze statues of, uh, from the ship, uh, from the shipwreck. And uh, consequently, the, the Greek government um, recovered as much of the, the, the treasure as they could from this wreck. And much of it now resides in the, the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. 
um, there was statues, there was uh, glassware that was found, um, and then there was also a lump of clay that was brought up in a, in a bucket and basically left in the courtyard of the museum to, uh, to dry. And when it dried out, it split open and revealed um, gears, bronze gears in the inside of this, this lump of clay. And uh, it was at that point they knew they had something pretty interesting here. This is uh, a microfocus CT study of the largest fragment in the, in the mechanism, fragment A, and you can see the, the numerous gears here. There are um, 30, 30 known gears in the mechanism. There, there probably were more than that. Um, but in this one fragment alone, there are, there are uh, 27 uh, gears uh, that you can see with, with CT. So a very complex device. At the time, it was known that the, the Greeks used gears, but uh, very, very primitively for mechanical things like turning a water wheel. Um, the fact that they did uh, calculations like this, uh, what turned out to be astronomical calculations, uh, was definitely not understood at the time of this discovery. So just to give you a, a feel for uh, the size of the, the scale of, these, uh, of the artifact, um, these are the three fragments that are, appear in the, the National uh, Archaeological Museum in Athens. Um, but there are not just three or four, there are actually 82 of these fragments. And so in 2005, we went over to Greece and spent a week um, applying our imaging technique to the front and back sides of all the artifacts. We took four and a half thousand photographs during that week and we produced 82 separate PTMs um, of all the, the surfaces. And these are all publicly available now on uh, an HP Labs website that anyone can get access to, anyone has access to is public. Um, and has been downloaded uh, often by, by people studying the Antikythera mechanism. Um, so it was appreciated in, uh, by, by a German scientist in 1905 that this was a, uh, some sort of an astronomical calculator uh, that was found. Um, but real breakthroughs were not made until Derek DeSola Price uh, came on the scene. And he actually wrote a Scientific American article in the year I was born, 1959, um, on, the, on the mechanism that's, that's also very informative. And one of the most important things Price did was he involved a, a Greek radiologist, um, physicist, who took uh, x-rays of the mechanism. And clearly, you can see uh, you know, the complexity of the gear assemblies in, in it from the x-rays. What you can also see is that um, one of the, the gear teeth had, uh, gear wheels had 127 teeth on it which is kind of an odd number to, to put on a, a gear. And so Price you know, correctly determined that this was, had something to do with the metonic cycle, which has twice that number of months, uh, sidereal months, in, the, uh, in its cycle, um, and that this was, in fact, uh, some sort of astronomical computer. And Price um, hypothesized a, a model of the, of the mechanism, which was was right overall. It was it was, it was close to correct, but has has details that are incorrect on pretty much all the the gear trains that that appear in it. Um, so there, as I mentioned, there are two groups that were sent to, to apply imaging techniques to the mechanism. Uh, the first was uh, this company XTech that does microfocus CT work, uh, CAT scan work. Um, they use energy levels that are much higher than what you're capable of using for medical applications, and so they can get very um, precise, fine images out from this technique. Um, unfortunately, the, the museum did not allow us to remove any of the artifacts from the, uh, uh, from the museum, including the Antikythera mechanism, so we had to bring all the equipment into, the, into Athens, into the National Archaeological Museum, which wasn't too bad for us, but for these guys, it was, it was tricky. This is a 12-ton CT machine, and they literally shut down the streets of Athens for a few hours to bring this into the museum. So it was brought in on, on truck uh, into, into Athens. Um, and so let me just show you one more data set. The, the sequence you saw earlier was also from their CT data. Uh, this is just a, a cutaway uh, cutting through the mechanism. Just take a look at the complexity of the, of the gears that you see here. And, and by the way, none of the gears are intact. It's not just a simple matter of counting the gear teeth. Uh, establishing how many, how many teeth each gear had is, is a, a tricky process on, on its own. <clears throat> okay, and we were the other group that got sent down there. This is the uh, PTM assembly that we took down there. 
um, imaging fragment C. So just a, a Nikon D70 camera um, and, uh, and 50 light sources that were programmable. So as I mentioned already, we put all our data on the web um, at, at the full resolution. Let me show you some of the, the things that we captured here. And I guess before I pull it up, I should say that, um, that this one fragment actually tells you enough to, to date the mechanism roughly itself. Um, but in, for dating, uh, it was also helpful that they found coins on the, surface, on the ship itself that date back from 86 to 60 BC. They were able to radiocarbon date the, uh, the timbers, the mass of the ship itself. That's from, so the ship was from about 200 uh, BC. But let me show you this fragment in, in a little bit of detail here. Um, so again, helpful to vary lighting direction to study it, but when you turn on the, the, the specular enhancement technique, it's, it's really quite easy to, to see the, the writing on the surface of it. So the first thing that jumps out on you at you is that um, most of the characters are run together. Well, it turns out that the ancient Greeks didn't use spaces except to demarcate numbers. So it's pretty clear to uh, see that this is a number, this is a number. They turn out to be both, uh, both be uh, astronomical numbers. Um, you can also date it from the writing itself. So if you'll notice that this sigma here is, uh, the, the top and bottom bars are somewhat splayed out. Um, that's, that's indicative of, of the second century BC writing style. Um, as is the fact that on this pi down here, this leg of the pi is slightly shorter than, than this leg of the pi. That's, uh, again, indicative of sec second century BC writing. So this one little fragment that's um, about an inch across uh, was, uh, is, is quite helpful in, in dating the device. Um, here's just a, uh, a blow up of, of some of the numbers that occur. These are all uh, astronomical cycles that occur that the mechanism describes, and I'll, I've, I've got a slide to define all these in a minute, but basically there are 76 years in something known as the Calypic cycle, there's 19 years in the Metonic cycle, and 223 months, uh, sidereal months, in a, in a Sarah cycle. Okay, so certainly one of the things that we did was allow a new modality for people to see more detail on the surface of the object, but actually another contribution was just providing high resolution photographs of the thing to scholars. This turns out to be the best photograph that was publicly available before our work to, to, to scholars that were studying the, the mechanism of that same fragment. Um, so it was just good to, to update it all. <clears throat> this is um, one more example of a fragment of the mechanism. Um, let me zoom into a little part of that. And you can certainly see moving the light source around that you've got some, some detail on the surface of that. But again, turn on one of the enhancement techniques and, and that detail becomes pretty obvious that you've got some ancient writing all over the surface of this thing. Much of this has been decoded now. Um, for those of you that can read ancient Greeks, this is actually upside down, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, but we basically were able to go from being able to read, um, well, in, in combination with the CT work, uh, we were able to go from reading about 800 characters to being able to read about 3,000 characters. And it turns out that jump um, really does, does contribute a lot to, uh, to the understanding of what this thing was and, and how it worked. So um, <clears throat> this is what the mechanism probably looked like, um, front and back side of it. Uh, it had a, a large, uh, uh, dial um, and pointer on the front that indicated uh, basically the zodiac. It's a calendar dial. Uh, there's both an, an Egyptian and a Greek uh, calendar on the surface of that. Um, and uh, on the back side is what's known as the Metonic dial and the the, uh, the Saros dial. These these are both. Um, First of all, it's, it's the first known scientific instrument in history. Um, these are the first dials, uh, graduated dials that, that occur uh, in, any, in any artifact. Um, and basically what these two in the back demonstrate is this is showing you the metonic cycle, which has to do with the, the correspondence between the, the Earth's, uh, the Moon's rotation and the Earth's rotation around the Sun. And this is uh, showing what's known as the Sarah cycle, which is useful for predicting eclipses, both solar and lunar eclipses, um, hundreds of years out. Um, the, uh, the data that, uh, that this seems to be based on is, is probably about 500 years worth of 
astronomical observations that the Babylonians actually made um, before, the, before the Greeks. So how do we know that it's hand cranked? Um, we don't strictly know that it's hand cranked. It could have been driven by something like a water wheel, but um, given that it's a, a quite small compact object, it probably had a little crank on the side of it. This is just a, um, you know, an axle that connects to the main drive wheel that has an obvious little slot that looks like, sure looks like you would, you would stick a handle into that and, and, and crank it. So that's the, that's the evidence for that. This is an animation I want to show here that Tony Freeth produced. Um, uh, it is of the complete mechanism as it's understood now. Um, all, uh, well, 29 of the gears are involved in, in this animation. Um, and you can see the, just the remarkable complexity of this thing. One of the things I want to point out real quickly is this little black, what looks black right now, is actually a little sphere that's both black and white. And as it rotates around, it's telling you, it's showing you the phase of the moon. So when it's all white, it's a full moon. When it's black, it's a new moon. Um, so this is, this is the mechanism as it, as it operated without the, uh, without the box around the side of it, you know, to cut away. And this is uh, how Tony and our group in general um, believes how the, the mechanism worked and how the, the gears went together. I'm not going to go into any detail on this at all. But you can see that the, the, you know, the hand crank here input drives both the front dials, which are the calendar dial again, and the, the back, which are both um, you know, the, the lunar solar uh, calendar and the eclipse prediction, the Sarah cycle. OK, so let me define some of these terms I've been using. Um, so what you think of as a, a full moon to a full moon cycle takes 29 and a half days. Um, that's called a synodic month. Now, if you look at that from the reference system of, of the sun instead of the earth, you know, obviously the earth is rotating around the sun as this is all is happening. So the, the, in the reference system of the sun, for the moon to get to the same position, that's called a sidereal month. It's so much shorter, 27 and a half days. Um, the metonic cycle, well, we know that, uh, that the orbit of the moon is not phase locked with the orbit of the sun, uh, sorry, the orbit of the earth around the, the sun, uh, but they do coincide roughly uh, every uh, 19 years ago, every 235 synodic months. Uh, that's called a metonic cycle, and that is, is displayed by the mechanism. If you add one day to every fourth year of that, uh, you get a cycle now that's 76 years long that's called the clipic cycle. That's also shown, likely was shown on the, the surface of the, of the mechanism. Um, the Sarah cycle is interesting. So uh, it was known that eclipses can reoccur every 223 synodic months. And um, uh, that, uh, that cycle is called the Sarah cycle. Um, and is, is definitely one of the more complex things that the, the mechanism shows. Um, again, if you, uh, now, that, that repeat of, of, uh, of, of eclipses turns out to be eight hours off. And so you have these eclipses occurring at different parts of the planet um, with the Sarah cycle. So if you repeat this cycle three times, you get what's known as the exoligamous cycle, which is more accurate. And in that, it's, it's possible that an eclipse can hap that happened in one place on the Earth will occur at a similar spot on the Earth um, you know, 54 years later. And then the last thing that the, uh, that the Antikythera mechanism shows is what's called the first lunar no anomaly. And that is that the orbit of the, of the, of the moon is not perfectly circular. It's, it's somewhat elliptical. And so the moon speeds up and slows down. That's, that's called the first lunar anomaly. And it, believe it or not, this mechanism even, even, uh, even predicts that or even demonstrates that, that anomaly. OK, so let me give you three examples of how the imaging was used to uncover some of the details of the mechanism here. So if you look at the largest fragment, fragment A, and the back side of it, um, on the right side there, you'll see uh, very faint it, uh, markings. And if I highlight those, you can see where they are and that they're spaced uniformly. Um, what you can also see is that every fifth or sixth uh, it, um, spacing apart, either one, five, or six spacings apart, there are uh, there there's writing that you can you can see uh, these little glyphs, and um, if you apply the PTM techniques to that, you can certainly pull out some of that writing and make it quite a bit more visible. Um, now this is showing 
a spiral where all the known locations of these markings uh, occur. And if you extrapolate and basically put them back into the, the, the four uh, cycles of the, of the dial, and, and both the Metonic and the Saros um, dials were spiral, they were not circular. Um, you wind up with 223 months, as again we know is the number of months in a, in a Saros cycle. Um, and if you now look at the location of the known glyphs that are on that, uh, they're located here. And we can certainly pull all those up into one view. So these are the, the 16 um, known glyphs that are, that are visible. You know, some of these that are a little easier to write appear on the surface and are pulled out by PTMs. Some of the other ones that are, are problematic are, you know, you can only see with, with CT uh, rendering, so they're, they're not quite as, quite as crisp. Um, but you can highlight uh, some of the text that occurs on this. And what you'll see repeating over and over are H's, which turn out to stand for Helios, uh, ancient Greek for sun. And these sigmas are shorthand for uh, Selene, or Selene uh, which is uh, a word for the moon. And so this is referring to both lunar and solar eclipses. And the rest of the writing below actually tells you the hour and the day that uh, these eclipses could possibly occur at. So if you now go back and you place the, the known glyphs, you can make predictions about where the, the remaining glyphs must have occurred uh, on the surface of that dial. Okay, the second thing I want to point out was something known as the, the pointer follower. And as I mentioned already, the dials in the, in the back are spiral in shape. And so it's not clear from just the pointer itself which of the four or five uh, arms of the spiral you should be reading off when you use this mechanism. Well, it turns out we found a, uh, you know, here's, here's an arm of a, of a pointer, and here's a little nub that sticks down in the CT renderings. And this is a, a rendering that Tony produced of, uh, you know, what it probably looked like uh, new. And that is, this thing is a, a pointer follower. So this sleeve, is free to slide on the surface of this pointer. And um, this pointer follower rides in little grooves that are in the underside of uh, the mechanism. And let me just show you uh, an example of, of that, a rendering of that, again, that Tony Freeth produced. Um, you know, as these, as these dials rotate around, the pointer follower slides out and tells you which of the particular four or five rings to, to read out at any point in time. And presumably, when it gets to the end of its, its, uh, its travel, you have to manually reset it back to the original. But we really don't, don't know if that's true or not. OK, so the, the last thing I want to point out, I, I, find, uh, I find just remarkable. And let me show, let me show that to you on uh, CT or on uh, PTM renderings. Again, we'll look at the backside of, of fragment A. And this time, Let's zoom into the area around these two sets of gears here. And let me turn on the enhancement techniques again so you can see the surface a little bit better. So I want you to keep your eye on this little notch down here that's taken out of the, the, uh, the, 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 the gear wheel. And you know, as you can see, it's a, it's a little cutout. And at first, it was thought that this cutout had something to do with the fact that maybe the antikythera mechanism was repaired. Um, but it was noticed that, uh, that, this, that in the cutout, there's actually a slight pin. There's a, a tiny little circular area, which you can see better in the CT renderings. So let me pull that up. Um, right here, here's the same little notch. And here's the pin that, that we're talking about. So it turns out what this was was a little pin slot arrangement that tied two gears together that were sitting on top of each other. And um, this is an epicyclic arrangement, meaning that, um, first of all, that the axles of these two gears were slightly offset, and um, they were mounted on another gear that was free to rotate. And um, basically what this did, without going into exact detail on, on the me mechanism, was it predicted this first lunar anomaly. It actually caused the gear that's responsible for keeping track of the moon's uh, procession to slow down and speed up by exactly the amount that was known at the time or estimated at the time of that uh, epi you know, epicyclic behavior. Um, so this is, I mean, 
to me, this is, this is one of the more amazing parts of this mechanism. These guys, you know, in, in around, this, the mechanism was probably built around 150 BC. You know, in a time when North Americans were living in teepees, these guys were building mechanical calculators using bronze gears, you know, hand cut of this complexity that modeled the slowdown and the speed up of, of, the, uh, of the moon as it went around its orbit. It's just, it's just amazing. And there is nothing, there's nothing of comparable mechanical complexity in any civilization until you get to about 15 or 1600 when Europeans start building clocks. Uh, so this thing, you know, was 1,500 years ahead of its time. It clearly was so complex that there was no way that this could have been the first device of its kind that was built. Um, it's just there are too many mechanical subtleties to that to allow that. But it's the only one of its kind that's ever been recovered, um, which is a bit surprising. Probably it's explained though by the fact that bronze throughout the years has been an extremely valuable metal, and Things that were bronze got melted down to form cannonballs and, you know, and cannons, typically. And uh, the only reason the, the Antikythera mechanism survived was that it was underwater for 2,000 years. So, so let me just show you an animation of that last, uh, what was called a Hipparchus mechanism uh, for some time. Um, so here are the two pairs of gear teeth on the back, and you can see the little pin slot arrangement that ties the, the top gear onto the, the bottom gear. Again, animation was produced by Tony Freeth. Okay, so that's really all I want to say about the, the mechanism itself. Um, I want to, to go a little bit uh, into some of the imaging uh, work that's been done um, based on our technique uh, since then. And this first slide is just an overview of some of the devices that have been built uh, in the meantime. This is uh, not, most of these were built not by our group. Um, a couple of them were built by a nonprofit called Cultural Heritage Imaging. And the basic idea is that, you know, you just want to get a, 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 a collection of photographs from different lighting directions of the, of the same thing under, under uh, you know, under novel, novel lighting directions. Um, so let me just show you a couple of those uh, devices. This is, again, was built by Mark Mudge at Cultural Heritage Imaging. Very simple device. She's just got a digital camera on the top of a tripod here. He's got a, a, a stand that's holding a light source. And he's just moving that light source to different locations. Those locations are marked on a template, a piece of paper here that's got you know, markings of, of how high you should have the light and exactly where it should be. Um, so he's just me manually going through and collecting a few dozen images of, of the same thing. Um, this is also a very low cost way to, to approach it. This is um, a PTM assembly that was put together for a couple hundred dollars uh, by Walter Verhessen in uh, the Netherlands. Um, this is just a, uh, a low-end digital camera with uh, an extension on the flash. And then he bought a, a $3 styrofoam dome and drilled holes in the right places and, and just moves the, the flash assembly itself into the holes one at a time and, and takes a number of pictures. Um, so very simple. And then on the high end, you have devices like this that, again, was built by Cultural Heritage Imaging that... Uh, that have very carefully controlled, uh, color controlled uh, light sources that are brought in with optic fibers onto the surface of this. Um, with these kind of devices, you can make assurances that you're not exposing any of the museum's valuable artifacts to excessive amounts of radiation. You can carefully quantify exactly how much radiation you're applying, you know, what the frequency distribution is, and so on. So, this has been picked up by a couple uh, dozen groups around the world. And, and the reason is that all of our tools are, are pretty easy to use. They're on the web. Anybody can download them. Um, there's no licensing or anything like that. So basically what you do is you create a stack of images, and then you create with a text editor what's called an LP file, uh, which just tells you how many images you have in the data set, uh, where each image is, and what the, the light source, and a vector to the normalized light source direction. So what direction the lighting came from. That's it. And then you feed that into what we call the PTM fitter, and it spits out a, a PTM for you. And um, I should, I should uh, just make mention of this, this figure right here. It shows you 50 of the original uh, samples of, of luminance and then the function that was eventually fit to that. And you can see that will low pass again in this, in this lighting space, um, typically preserving details quite well, even in light space. 
But anyway, the fitter's available also for download. Um, and so you can just produce your own PTMs. So lots of people have done lots of things with it. Um, we had a, an interesting case I just want to mention um, with the FBI on a, an actual serial murder investigation. Um, the FBI would prefer I not show the original uh, data uh, publicly, so this is kind of a made-up version. But basically what we had was um, a serial murderer was keeping very detailed notes on what he was doing in a spiral-bound notebook. He unfortunately had managed to rip those out before they arrested him. Um, and what they had, what the FBI had, were very faint indentations on blank pieces of paper underneath those, those, uh, those, pa those papers. And we were able to bring out the indented writing. And this just shows another example of indented writing that I made up. Um, it turns out if you use this diffuse gain technique, you can really increase the contrast of this stuff and eventually you start seeing that you've got some indentations here. And even, I mean, even with our method, you have to, uh, by the way, this is the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Even with our, uh, with our method, you need to interactively do this. You, your visual system turns out to pull out much more information under motion and looking at different lighting directions. So for instance, you know, the, the, uh, the J, let me see if I can line this up accurately enough here. The, the J here on the letter jumped is, is best seen with, with lighting that's perpendicular to it. If you, if you put the lighting overhead, you really can't see it that well. If you put it off to the side, it's a little finicky. Let's see if I can dial it in here. Put it off to the, the side, you can really see the, the perpendicular brush stroke. So, ba so basically, you want to put the light source perpendicular to the, the strokes you're trying to recover. Um, okay, so it's been used in other criminal investigations. This is something that the California Department of Justice uh, put together. It's a, it's a rig that has a, um, an arm that's free to, to rotate and a digital camera on top. And it's very useful for, for capturing footprint uh, PTM. So let me show you another feature of the PTM viewer that I haven't shown off yet. Um, we can actually extrapolate the space beyond the lighting directions that we have or that are physically acquirable in the first place. I mean, it's basically like taking a light source and you got an object here moving it below the light source in some ways. So we can place one light source there. We can certainly take another one, place it off to some other grazing direction. We can take a third light source and, and put it somewhere else. And so, you know, eventually you can build up rings that are, that are pretty indicative of the, of the 3D shape. And what's interesting here is that, you know, once you collect a PTM like this, you can now perform this analysis much later, or as new techniques get developed, you can try applying them to the, to the device. Um, they've also been used by the National Gallery in London. This is a, an arm that we made, very simple, um, out of literally we just bought um, 12, very, 12 flash units, low-cost low flash units from a camera store, mounted them on an arm, and you know, they're manually, manually activated. <coughs> um, let me show you this PTM of a Franz Hall's painting uh, taken from the National Gallery in London. Um, so if we move the light source uh, you know, off to the side, you can see the vertical brush strokes quite well. Uh, if you move it to the top, you can see the horizontal brush strokes. And certainly in all cases, you can see the dust on the surface of the painting quite well. Um, OK, so. A few years ago, this begged the question to me that, OK, if you have control, interactive control of lighting like this, is there anything uh, analytic that you can say about the quality of the images that come out as a function of different lighting? Well, can you characterize, in effect, you know, how complex the images are as a function of lighting direction? Well, there's certainly a well-known uh, measure of, of inform information content in images, uh, image entropy. Um, that does correlate, as you can see, quite well with, with how much you can read in, in lighting direction. Um, that's not analytically drivable from the PTM equation, but fortunately variance, uh, which is uh, for Gaussian random variables, is monotonically related to uh, entropy, um, is, it's possible to compute that analytically from a PTM representation, basically meaning that once you have a PTM in you know, a half second, you can now produce maps of uh, variance or entropy uh, that tell you where are good places in the lighting space to look at this object. So where are you going to see more detail and where are you going to see less? And not surprising, every, uh, every surface has a different representation of, of image entropy and different 
um, you know, region where, where it's better to, to look for detail. Often it's in the grazing, grazing directions here. Okay, so um, this is just a quick slide to show that, uh, that PTMs can be collected under any frequency of light. This is using infrared lighting, um, some experiments that the National Gallery did. So far, we haven't found a, a great use for IR PTMs, um, but it's possible to collect them. Um, this, again, was produced by Volter Verhessen in the Netherlands, who has an interest in microscopy. And um, you can see, uh, again, both dark field effects and light field effects um, off of a single PTM. This is a, um, the wing of a, of a dragonfly at about 200x magnification. So this can be applied at very small scales. You can certainly apply it at very high scales as well. This is um, a PTM that I put together of a significant part of Arizona, uh, working with digital elevation data um, from a geologist named John Saul. Um, John believes that, uh, that a period in the Earth's time about three billion years ago called, called the late heavy bombardment, where uh, the Earth was, um, was uh, had catastrophic large meteors hit the surface of it, formed very large impact craters that you can still see evidence for today. And basically plate tectonics makes the prediction that you shouldn't really be able to see this stuff. But you know, sure enough, you can see circular structures like this one here um, that may be evidence for uh, late heavy bombardment uh, time frame. But this is what you're looking at is a significant chunk of Arizona here. So again, PTMs can be done at, at all kinds of spatial scales. Um, I want to show you that we've now developed a, an even easier way to collect these PTMs that requires nothing but a digital camera, um, a handheld flash, and a black snooker ball, uh, which you can buy for five bucks. So what you do is you put the black snooker ball into your scene next to the artifact that you want to capture, and you take pictures moving your uh, light source around to different locations. and turns out you can recover the direction of the light source from the reflection in the black snooker ball. Makes a lot of sense. Well, it turns out what's nice about this is you can do this fully automatically. You can, there's been some software written by um, a group from the University of Minho in Portugal uh, that you can just feed it a directory worth of, of images. It automatically finds the black ball. It automatically finds where the highlights are in the black ball. It automatically extracts the light source direction from those highlights and it runs the PTM fitter to produce the PTM out from your stack of images, all hopefully without manual intervention. Now, if, there, you know, if, it, if it fails and it doesn't find the black ball or, you know, automatically, you can go in and help it. Uh, but it's, it's automated the whole process. It made, it made it pretty simple to collect this kind of data. This is also downloadable from uh, our website, HP Labs. And let me just show you some renderings that were collected from data collected in that fashion. This is uh, some stone carvings that date from about 20 to 30,000 uh, years ago um, uh, of an antelope here. Here's the head of the antelope and the, the feet and the, the bodies right here. So it's certainly helpful to, to vary lighting to see that sort of detail. Okay, and <clears throat> we've also done this in real time. So one of the complaints we were getting from forensics and, and criminal investigators was that, you know, this is a lot of hardware to take out into the field. Uh, it'd be nice if they could just take things back to their lab and, and quickly collect images uh, based on that. And so um, what we did is we built a real-time assembly uh, that consists of a high-speed 500 frame per second video camera here and some arms that, that capture the, uh, the lighting information or that, that, that provide lighting. Um, in practice, we, we use eight light sources. And in a 60th of a second, we can collect all eight images at different lighting feed all that data down to a GPU, compute surface normals, compute reflectance transformations, and render the thing, um, which means that basically at video rates, you can produce um, uh, renderings of things that you hold in front of this assembly and start seeing more detail than, than you typically can. Um, so two o'clock is the end for this, right? Like, got about 10 minutes, is that right? Or I... Yeah, I'll, I'll save some time. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can produce renderings in real time with this technique. So this is just a demonstration of some of those uh, results. Um, here's an original view of the, of the surface of a basketball. Here is low frequency content being brought out from the basketball. 
and here's higher frequency content uh, being, being displayed on, from the basketball. So it turns out you can run these normal transformations in such ways that they have um, frequency effects, spatial frequency effects too, so you can bring out different spatial frequency components. So, so far, everything I've shown with PTMs um, has been covering variable lighting. Well, it turns out they're, they're useful for other things besides this. So this is just a simple example where I took six pictures of a boring office scene uh, at different focus settings and integrated them into a PTM. As you can see, we've got continuous interactive control of, of focus direction once we've done that. So this, to me, kind of begs the question, you know, why would you ever want to fix the focus conditions when, at the time you take the picture as opposed to collecting data like this and, and allowing you to, to play with it after the fact? And one of the last topics I'll, I'll mention here is, um, you know, everything I've shown you in terms of lighting with PTMs is from a specific viewpoint, one fixed viewpoint. You'd obviously like to be able to, for museum applications, capture an object from various viewpoints, allow the user to rotate it around and change lighting in real time. So we've taken some steps towards being able to do that. Um, specifically, um, we've generated these PTM object movies, which are, Quite simple, you know, conceptually. They're just PTMs taken at different uh, orientations of the object, and you know, in this case, we still have interactive control over lighting in real time, um, plus some view dependence. Obviously, you would like this not just to occur at static view locations. You'd like to have continuous control over the rotations. So we've been working with researchers at, at um, UC Santa Cruz to do just that, to collect. And it turns out one of the biggest problems here is the amount of data that you have to collect as you vary view direction and lighting direction is just enormous. And so we've done work in terms of you know, how, you, how you manage that trade-off, where you take more lighting directions, where you take more view directions. Good, and that's really all I had. I want to point out that um, this is the URL for the, the website that we have for uh, where all the tools are. Um, these are, you know, it's very easy for kind of hands-on people like, like you all are to, uh, to go ahead and experiment with. So feel free to, to play around with these tools. And I uh, just want to thank um, Dan Gelb specifically for developing the technique and the others that were involved in the researching the Antikythera mechanism. Thank you. That, that's really cool stuff, Tom. Uh, my favorite was the PTM at the global uh, scale of Arizona. That was pretty cool. Uh, so I wanted to point out two things. Uh, definitely go to check to his website. Just Google Tom and you'll find the PTM viewer, I'm sure. But interactively, you can change the lighting on uh, some sample PTMs he already has, and it's a pretty cool technique. And then if you have more interest in the anti-Cathera mechanism, uh, check out the December uh, issue of uh, Scientific American. And so we have time for a few questions. And uh, please use the microphone. Would it make any difference if you were to use coherent light? Um, <clears throat> not, not that I've been able to figure out, no. Um, I mean, you could use polarized light, you could use coherent light. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how to introduce that as a, you know, increase the functionality of a PTM with that, no. I mean, we've, we've certainly used varying frequency light sources, but uh, I don't know if, I'm not sure if coherence buys you anything with this technique. Have you, have you or anyone else uh, create PTMs using the sun as a, as a light source that moves around? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've looked at that. Um, I've, I've taken objects and, and photographed them automatically through various points of the day, and you can certainly make a nice one-dimensional PTM out of that. And I could probably pull up an example if you give me enough time of that. Um, but since the sun travels in a one-dimensional path, you don't have the full two dimensions of, that you need to fully capture a PTM. So you can't make a, a two-dimensional PTM out of one. But yeah, we have done one-dimensional PTMs. They look good. Kind of related to that, too, is an obvious thing to do is to, take, is to make a PTM of the moon. Because mostly, the moon is facing the same direction uh, at the various phases. 
So it'd be very simple to just photograph the moon every night and combine that into a, a PTM. Now you've got control over lighting on the surface of the moon. Unfortunately, the problem with that is the moon actually rocks back and forth. I think it's like five degrees or so um, enough so that the you know the images would not be registered well enough in 3D to make that happen. It would need to be compensated for, which is all doable, but has not been done yet. Uh, what about the uh, the color, the the number of bits of color depth you have? Is there anything uh, you know? Is eight bits per you know RGB good enough uh, for this technique, or do you need to do anything special in terms of the type of camera that you have and the 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 bit depth? Um, so. This technique really works well for diffuse objects <coughs> and, um, and then adding specular highlights in for that. And for that class of, of images and, and data sets, diffuse shading turns out not to have enough dynamic range where you need to really worry about high dynamic range. If you're trying to capture true synthetic specular highlights, and we've done work on that you know, as well you know, since, this, since the paper, it's the original 2001 paper, um, yeah, you need high dynamic range for doing that, certainly. Um, specular highlights are, are so bright, typically, that they blow out the eight bits of dynamic range. You can't get good data in both the, the low, you know, the low, the low order and the high order. So, yeah. But one of the things, we've also um, looked at how much resolution you need uh, for displaying the coefficients of the, of the PTM itself. And it turns out, you know, we've got a, a trick in here. We have a, a global scale and bias scale and bias values that are in the PTM file that allow basically you to store all the PTM coefficients at 8 bits resolution. That's adequate. Um, so there are definitely resolution tricks you can play. Have there been any applications in movie making? In movie making? Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a researcher at USC named Paul Debevec uh, who has done some very impressive work throughout the years um, applying relighting sorts of techniques to movies. Um, so he's, he's certainly done quite a bit of that and uh, very successfully and, and works closely with Hollywood doing that. So yes, absolutely. Um, one of the more interesting th things that Paul's built is a, is a large dome with colored lights on the surface of it so they can actually um, simulate the lighting on an actor uh, from a, a completely synthetic environment. So they can go ahead and, and capture the lighting environment of a synthetic uh, environment, or of a, sorry, of a real environment, and then produce it synthetically to match the lighting that you're producing on an actor to that of the of the some other environment. Yeah. <clears throat> um, not a question, I guess, an observation. It, it seems to remind me a lot of uh, how the planoptic or light field cameras work, with uh, yeah. each pixel being sort of a, a bundle of incident rays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we we. We noticed that parallel as well when we, you know, even before we developed this technique. You know, if you look at, if you try to apply PTM techniques or the polynomial itself to uh, values that are taken as you vary camera location as opposed to varying lighting, it turns out there's, there's just not as much coherence to the, those pixel values. And so really a, a low order representation like this just doesn't work for representing light fields, whereas it works beautifully for this. Um, and you know, one of the reasons it works for this is, first of all, there's a lot of redundancy in, in, the, in the data, but also the, the human visual system really can tolerate quite a bit of sloppiness um, you know, in this. So when you make one of these PTMs, if you have errors of you know, even up to like 5% of your estimation of light source direction, you won't see any artifacts in the, in the original uh, or in the, in the PTM that's produced. And the reason for that is, is quite simply, yeah, you might have to move the light source, the synthetic light source, to a slightly different location. It might be five degrees off now in the rendering, but in the end, you'll get a very, you know, very similar result. So it's very robust, and applied to light fields, it would not be so robust. So. Yeah. Um, were all your photographs done in white light? Have you ever done like the red, green, blue separately and then combine them and, and I mean, and we, ty vary those? we typically do it in white and then we can separate, again, the PTM uh, representation in each of the color channels independently and then, you know, we certainly can have control over color in that way. So yeah, it can be, it can be done under, under really any, any color light source, but typically white we, we do for generality. So. Great, well, thank, thanks very much for your attention.